Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at vafb.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all of the wonderful products we enjoy. Brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Farmers are being encouraged to take advantage of a new tax credit to benefit Virginia food banks and those in need. Fresh Virginia asparagus is always a healthy seasonal treat and we have a new recipe to share. And Virginia's Ag in the Classroom Teacher of the Year goes the extra mile to share the fun of farming with his students. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you from the Feed More Food Bank facility in downtown Richmond. Spring is here, and farmers are being asked to consider donating more fresh produce this year. A new state income tax credit should make that easier than ever. In 2018, the seven regional food banks serving the Old Dominion distributed almost 40 million pounds of fresh produce to hungry Virginians. But the demand for fresh produce keeps growing, and farmers have an opportunity to help even more thanks to a state food donation tax credit. Fresh produce is one of the more nutritious items um, that we're able to distribute. It's often the most um, expensive item that our low-income families have to try to get at the at grocery store. And so the more we can um, source that locally, the better, because we believe in working with our local farmers, supporting our local agricultural economy we know helps everybody in the communities we serve. And so the more we can build those bridges and get food straight off the, off the field and into our pantries, the better. Eddie Oliver is executive director of the Federation of Virginia Food Banks. This umbrella group represents the regional warehouses and distribution points that collect and distribute most of the bulk foods donated from the USDA and businesses. Greg Knight at the Blue Ridge Area Food Bank agrees more fresh produce is their top need. The chief reason is fresh food is the best food. We have a lot of instances of uh, clients with hypertension, diabetes, things like that, that fresh food is going to help with that, where some of the more processed foods is going to work as a negative toward nutrition. The other reason that uh, local food is important for us is if we bring a truckload of food in from, say, the southeast or the Midwest, I've got a freight bill to pay. So that may be anywhere from $2,000 to $4,000. I can keep that and apply it to other programs and food if we get the, the food locally. Plus, it's just the right thing to do to help our local economy. The 2017 Virginia General Assembly agreed to allow farmers a state income tax credit for donating food, worth up to 30 percent of the fair market retail or wholesale value of crops like grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables. Farmers often end up with extra produce that's either not profitable to sell or not aesthetically pleasing enough for the grocery shelf. The tax credit is a good incentive for those producers to donate but it also reinforces a farmer's natural instinct to feed people, especially those less fortunate. Danny and Evelyn Darlene Castle of Carroll County started donating extra sweet corn three years ago. Now they deliberately plant a few extra rows of cabbage each year. With our economic situation in this country this day and time, a lot of people can't go, afford to go out to the grocery stores and buy fresh produce. It gives us opportunity to market, market some of our produce that don't go, won't go to the market, fresh market. Like if a cabbage get too big or if you get behind in your spraying system, your schedule, you can get rid of the cabbage like that. Like I said, it's a win-win situation for both of us. We, we donate it to them and they give it to people to eat and then they give us a tax credit back on our income tax. Apples are a staple donation to food banks because they hold up well in shipping and storage. Jamie Williams with Turkey Knob Growers says his orchard takes advantage of the tax credit every year. What it does is it makes it more valuable than sticking it to a processing facility or dumping it. It gives us it gives us a it gives us an additional market to take the fruit to and you know you feel better when someone is getting enjoyment out of it and especially a nutritional product and hopefully that's going to create another uh, customer years on down the line. 
Producers interested in the food donation tax credit can learn more and download forms from the Virginia Department of Taxation website or contact the Federation of Virginia Food Banks at 804-549-5675. We at the Food Bank try to make that as simple as possible. So at the end of each month, we review the local donations. If there are donations that qualify for the tax credit, we then run the form for them. Page three of that form is on the Food Bank. We do that. We determine the market value of the uh, product using the USDA Market Services website. So that makes it as user-friendly as possible. Beyond that, it's the farmer and his or her bookkeeper that has to do the rest of it, but we think it's a pretty user-friendly process for the grower. Farmers and food banks alike agree it's a good program to help those less fortunate Virginians that just need more donations to make a difference. The seven warehouse and distribution food banks in the Old Dominion distributed a total of 139 million pounds of food and grocery products to almost 1.2 million needy Virginians in 2018. They act as the shipping, storage, and central points for more than 2,608 local agencies, everything from small food pantries at local churches to large-scale feeding programs that serve shut-ins and the elderly. They also provide food to after-school programs for children, senior citizens, Head Start classes, mental health programs, homeless and domestic violence shelters, and individual households. Visit their website at vafoodbanks.org. I'm Mark Viet. Coming up on In the Garden, I'm going to talk about forcing flowers to bloom earlier for you and how to preserve some flowers so they last longer indoors. Stay with us. Farm Bureau is the insurance provider of choice for farmers. But did you know all Virginians can benefit? In fact, most of our members are not farmers. Members may take advantage of discounts on selected autos, trucks, mowers, and tractors on top of the many insurance offerings. Your $40 membership will easily pay for itself with their many savings options as well. Farm Bureau is made for Virginians. To learn more about the membership advantage, go to VAFB.com or visit your local Farm Bureau. A beautiful cut flower can be a treasure to behold, but sometimes you might want that flower to bloom a little bit early. Mark Viet shows us just how it's done in the garden. Hellebores orientalis, also known as the Lenten Rose, and there's other varieties of Hellebores that start blooming during the winter and into spring, is a beautiful plant, all different colors. You know, some of the new varieties that I don't have in my garden yet are almost scarlet. But these are really a telltale sign that spring is arising. And one of the things you can do is you can cut these and bring them indoors. Now, keep in mind, these, this is a highly deer-resistant plant, so it does have some toxic quality. So if you have pets that are going to feed on them, you might not want to do it. You just can't go out and cut hellebores and put them in water. They're going to wither away because the sap's going to leak out of the stem. So you cut them, you put them in a, uh, a vase that can handle hot water, and I have boiling water, and what I will do is set them in boiling water for about a minute. And when that minute or two is over, that's going to seal the stem. Then I'm going to take them out of that and put them in their regular vase, and they will stay like this indoors for a week or two. You can bring a little bit of spring or summer indoors earlier than when plants normally bloom. And you can harvest some of these things in the garden four to six weeks before they bloom and treat them in a certain way so they come into flower. What I've done is cut some of these plants that are about two, three, four weeks away from blooming, put them in a deep bucket, and that deep bucket contains hot water. Not scalding hot water, but hot water. And the plant absorbs them, and it sort of forces them into bloom. To give you an example, one of the uh, great plants that I like is the saw magnolia. It always freezes, so I like to harvest them ahead of time. And as you can see, after 24 hours in hot water, they're coming into bloom. Another great heirloom plant is quince. 
You do have to be careful with quince because it has a lot of thorns, but the flowers are beginning to open just within 24 hours. You can also force broom, which blooms earlier than forsythia. Just by putting them in hot water, they're coming into bloom. I also like cornelian cherry or cornice moss. You can force that beautiful yellow flowers. Then we have Pieris, which is a great shade loving plant. This is what it would normally look like in the garden, but after putting them in hot water, they come into bloom and they are fantastically fragrant. Wonderful plant. There's also Coralopsis, and the ones that are in hot water are already coming into bloom where these won't bloom for another two to three weeks. Forsythia is another one that you can force. And the last one you could consider is the late flowering dogwood. Just force it and you can have beautiful eclectic arrangements with this type of dogwood. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Springtime means fresh asparagus in the Old Dominion. Chef John Maxwell has a new twist on how to serve this vegetable next in the heart of the home. And now, a sneak peek into a day in the life of a Virginia dairy cow. They get their day started. They have some lunch. Get some exercise. Spend time with their friends. And then end their day with dairy sweet dreams. Real dairy, real life, real delicious. There are 30,000 roadway accidents each year involving cars and farm machinery. Farmers will be moving equipment for planting and harvest season. The slow moving vehicle triangle in red and fluorescent orange colors and flashing lights allow for quick identification. When you see an SMV sign on farm equipment, slow down, prepare for sudden stops and slow turns. Patience will save lives. Just remember we all need to share the road, we all need to be responsible, and we need to be guided by the law. Motor vehicle safety starts with you. One of the first fresh vegetables of the season is always asparagus. Chef John Maxwell combines Virginia apples and onions for a flavorful dish in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Chef John Maxwell and welcome to Heart of the Home. We're here at Doswell, Virginia at Meadow Event Park in Meadow Hall. And we're gonna get ready to play with some great Virginia food. This time, spring, we got wonderful asparagus and there's lots of asparagus being grown in Virginia. Uh, we're gonna do something a little different with it. We're gonna saute it with some apples and onions and kind of caramelize that mix. So the first thing I'm doing is I've got butter here. Gonna get it hot. Butter has got some solids in it and that'll help caramelize it. Once it gets hot and it starts to brown off a little bit, I'm gonna add some oil. That'll let it go to a higher temperature. All right, so I've got the butter is in there. I'm gonna add these onions, all right? All right, let them get started. I want these to caramelize, all right? That means to turn a little bit brown. Right, that's gonna take about five minutes to get some color on them. Don't wanna do it too hot, but wanna get them nice and brown so the onions are soft and it's, you know, you, wonderful kind of sloppy undercoating for the uh, asparagus. Okay, these onions now are starting to caramelize. You can see how they're starting to turn a little bit brown. That's what it means. If the sugars in the onion are beginning to brown off. So that's gonna sweeten them a little bit. Now that they're ready, I'm gonna go ahead and add some shallots in there. And I'm gonna add a little bit of oil. All right. Because right. oil will get to a higher temperature without browning. So I want to slow down the browning process now. All right. All right. Turn the heat down so it hits slower. All right, now these onions are nice and brown. They've got room for a little bit more, but they're browning off nicely. And I'm going to go ahead and peel this apple. 
Let's see. I browned off the onions. Normally I would try and brown the apples and the onions in the same pan, but it's kind of delicate and I didn't want to make a mess on TV. So I'm going to go ahead and caramelize these apples in a separate pan and then add them to the onions. Now, apples are a little bit harder to caramelize because they've got so much water in them, right? Got to evaporate out the water first before they can start to caramelize. So I got the butter browned off nice, so that it's going to give these apples some color. Let this get a little bit softer. Does not take long. I've got the asparagus. I've already trimmed them, peeled them, and blanched them. With that, this is the way the asparagus looks normally. Right? I trimmed it, peeled it with a vegetable peeler to get the outside skin off. Right? So I could get a nice graduated color. Then I dropped it in boiling water and then put it into ice water to chill it and stop the cooking. And this is what we get. This is before and this is after. So you can see it's, it's tender, it's graduated color. It's really very nice. So I'm going to add these in with the apples and onions and let them get hot. I'm going to add the, the apples and onions to the plate to make a little bed for these asparagus to sit on. All right, so now we're going to take the asparagus and put those on top. All right, that's that. Get this out of the way so you can see. Nice asparagus with caramelized apples and onions. It is incredibly good. So join us next week on Heart of the Home, where we get to play with great Virginia food. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at VAFB.com, as well as on Chef Maxwell's website at ChefJohnMaxwell.com. Asparagus is grown on 85 acres scattered across 105 farms in Virginia, and it's available at dozens of farmers' markets when they open for the season in spring. It's strictly a fresh market crop in the Old Dominion. None of it is sold for processing. It's also a relatively easy crop for home gardeners to grow. Asparagus can produce a crop for 12 to 15 years before it has to be replaced. The stems are easily frozen to save for later. Asparagus grows well where winters are cool and the soil freezes at least a few inches down. It's considered a very hardy plant. You're going to need me. You're going to need all of us. You're going to need the next generation of leaders to face the challenges the future will bring. And we promise we'll be there when you need us. Most agriculture in the classroom teachers use examples from farming to give their lesson plans a boost. Dave Miller visits with Virginia's top Ag of the Classroom teacher this year to see how he took things to the next level with spectacular results. Chris Nisley was so inspired by the early results of his use of agriculture in the classroom tools that he went back to school himself and got an advanced degree in poultry science. He is a science and biology teacher at Mark Twain Middle School in Fairfax, Virginia. The Virginia Agriculture in the Classroom Teacher of the Year and a National Ag in the Classroom Award winner for 2019. My journey to agriculture in the classroom was not a typical one. Um, I didn't grow up on a farm, I grew up in the city. Um, I thought that livestock were for petting zoos and fields were what you drove past on your way to grandma's. Um, but. I had this crazy idea that like what if our school had chickens and my former principal was on board with it and what I found is that as I had students help with the chickens and later help with the garden or help with the aquariums or the hydroponics their understanding of life science got better and better and better and better. 
Um, and so I realized kind of accidentally that agriculture can be a very effective tool towards not only filling in students' gaps in background knowledge, but connecting them to the content in a meaningful and productive way. Nisley's co-worker, Barbara Van Leer, sees firsthand the benefits of the Ag in the Classroom program in her classes and the skills that Nisley brings to the table. Chris has done a phenomenal job integrating agriculture into the classroom. Most of the students here are from the suburban Washington, D.C. area. They don't have experience in agriculture per se. So bringing the chickens and all of the gardening aspects into the classroom has been quite a learning and a, a therapeutic experience for some of the kids. Nisley began his chicken flock with eight chicks in the classroom, kept in a makeshift coop constructed from an old bookcase and some chicken wire. He then decided to build a full-on chicken coop in the main school courtyard with a fenced-in run. The kids love to gather the eggs and get their hands on the many different breeds of chickens on their farm. He has inspired several students to continue on in agriculture and even veterinary sciences. One of the first students that helped me out, um, which was actually the only student that came over the summer I built that and uh, helped me with it, um, you know, her and her dad really got into chickens because of this process. And she was one of the first ones to stay after school and help with any of the farm stuff. And really that's what helped me realize that this is good in the classroom. And so as she grew older, she kept coming back and teaching what she had learned to the students. Um, she, for her Gold Star Award for Girl Scouts, actually built a fruit tree farm up by the door over there. Um, and I get a message from her in December of this year saying that she got accepted early to Virginia Tech's Animal and Poultry Science Program and saying that if it wasn't for the things that I helped her learn that she had a passion for, she wouldn't have done that. Nisley is an innovator. His classroom now houses hydroponic lettuce and vegetables. His students are growing mushrooms both indoors and out, and they even operate an aquarium with self-cloning crawfish that lay eggs already fertile and ready to reproduce. He keeps the students engaged, even when taking a quiz or studying. Ten years from now, who knows what's going to be going on. But one thing that's a constant is our need to eat and our need to grow products for our own use. Um, that's something that is one of the defining characteristics of humans, and it's something that's not going away. I don't need to prepare my students for the ag jobs of today. I need to inspire them and teach them how to innovate so they can fulfill the ag jobs of tomorrow. And that's why we focus on things about trying to find creative ways to grow things hydroponically or reusing urban refuse in an agricultural application. Uh, because I want my students to see that we can innovate that we can make changes to an existing system and that we can make improvements for a better tomorrow. The Mark Twain Middle School Ag in the Classroom program is considered a national leader and model for using agriculture production to engage students and improve learning. Nisley says he and his fellow teachers are more than willing to help share their knowledge of resources and connections learned over the years with other educators. Just contact them. You can learn more about Virginia's Ag in the Classroom program at their website, agclassroom.org slash VA. In Fairfax County, this is Dave Miller. We are so glad you could join us this week to celebrate all the bounty that Virginia has to offer. From your kitchen to your home and garden to our wide open spaces, we're proud to say that this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching and make it a great week. Chesapeake Bay.